Let's Solve the Universe, Episode 6, recorded November 20th, 2018. Let's Solve the Universe can be found online at lstupodcast.com. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, fellow members of the internets. How are you today? That's good. I hope you're having a wonderful day and that we can make it even better with another dynamic episode of Let's Solve the Universe. My guest today, or your guest, since really this is your podcast, you've made the decision to allow this audio recording to enter into your ears, and for that, I applaud you. However, my guest today, she is a research assistant, chief business officer, and fairy. Isn't that interesting? In fact, she is the fairy podmother. She is on a mission to destigmatize women's health issues, and she's doing so through her initiative, the Fairy Podmother. What is the Fairy Podmother, you might ask? Well, it's a good thing we recorded a two hour episode. You'll be able to hear all about it. Most recently, Amanda was political manager for Josh Morgan's re election campaign. She has the distinct honor of being a political manager, one of the first political managers in Canada to have worked on a ranked ballot municipal election. Pretty neat stuff, folks. She does many different things on any given day. And man, did we have a lot to talk about. I made a page full of notes and we got to almost none of them. Incredible person doing some amazing things, trying to make the world a better place. She's brilliant. What more could you ask for? Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome the great, the wonderful, Amanda McNeil. I think that's good sound. Give me a couple test words. Uh, Pneumona ultramicroscopic silico vacaniconiosis. What in the hell is that? Uh, it's technically, I think, the longest word in the English language, but it's a medical word, so it's a bunch of small words chunked together, but it's a disease you get if you inhale volcano ash. If you inhale volcano ash? Yes. That is crazy specific. Yep. <laughs> How did you learn that one? I did spelling bees growing up. Wow. <laughs> did you ever win any of the championships like that? No. Aw. No, that's okay, though. I didn't know that spelling bees were still a thing. Yeah, they weren't. I don't know how popular they are still. They're kind of around when I did it. There weren't that many, but I, it was a good I, enough time. I always thought that was an American thing. Like, they really like their spelling bees. Yeah, you had to, like, seek it out. <laughs> <laughs> there were, like, spelling bee classes that you could go to. Classes? Yeah, you'd go to, like, prep classes for, like, three or four weeks leading up to the spelling bee, like, once or twice a week. You'd come to a London library and get in a group and you'd learn how to spell and break down words and do strategy. And it was all like included if you just signed up for the spelling bee. So I was like, yeah. whoa, <laughs> that's an intense world. Yeah. So like, were they like regional championships and then you went even higher than that? Yeah. So you'd start with like city. So it'd be London and area because I'm from St. Thomas. And then if you won that, then you would go to like Southwestern Ontario region. And I never got past that. I only did it once, but um, and then you would go to like, I think Ontario region then Canada, but yeah, it was just, I wanted to just see what it was like and do it one time. Wow. Are there adult spelling bees now? I don't think so. Ah, oh, that'd be interesting. Game shows. <laughs> yeah. Wheel of fortune or something like that. Exactly. Cool. All right. We got our sound check. Everything sounds good. So let's do this. Amanda McNev. Did I get the name right? McNev? Yes. Cool. What nationality is that? Technically Lithuanian, but it was shortened from a longer last name. What was the longer last name? McNevichis. Whoa. That's yeah. That's a lot of Scrabble tiles. Yeah. Uh, Lithuanian. It's okay. Not a lot of people can spell it, so that's why my dad shortened it. Ah, fair enough. Only six letters. Easy to work with. You do a lot of different things, and I've been wanting to talk with you for a long time. Oh, a couple of things. Yeah. I mean, one of the most recent things I saw you do was or work on was as a political manager. Yes. So I did a campaign here in London um, for a candidate named Josh Morgan. 
then I also did some campaign work down in St. Thomas for the provincial election. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah. So what were you doing for the provincial? Um, just helping out one of the local campaigns. Uh, it was my first time doing a campaign at all, so getting your feet wet with canvassing, with doing uh, phone canvassing, so calling up people, trying to do get out the vote. It was a really good experience. And then transferred to doing the municipal one, which was also a really good experience, but just a whole different kind of um, style because... We were transitioning to the ranked ballot system, and even though my candidate didn't have a ranked um, order, there was only one other candidate, it was still kind of a hustle and bustle in London. Learning about all the new things and going to different like training sessions was pretty cool. Neat. The idea with the ranked ballot, from my understanding, is that it brings more candidates um, to a cooperative place because you want to be people's first option, obviously, but you also want to be their second so you can't just appeal to one smaller base. You have to appeal to more people. So it'll be really interesting to see how the council works together, because I think that was in a lot of voters' minds, because um, they were able to select one, two, and down for who they thought would work together, who would represent them. I'm just really excited to actually see. We're going to have a real interesting council. Mm -hmm. We've got a lot of newbies on the council, but we've also got a lot of veterans there, too. Yeah. And quite the political spectrum. I think that that's going to be a good thing. Um, brings more people into the conversation. Again, it'll be very interesting to see how a lot of them work together. It seems like there's already a lot of cooperation between them, which is very obviously very nice. Um, but then other places in Canada are picking up the ranked ballot system as well. So it's interesting being the first city to do it. And I hope that we have a good example to lead by. Despite the voter turnout being that low. Yeah. Because it was, what was it, around 35, 40%? Mm, I don't recall. Oh, shoot. Yeah. I remember it was something low anyway. But it was very interesting to go through the ranked ballot procedure this time. Mm -hmm. Though it was only limited to top three, wasn't it? Yeah, I believe so. Interesting. I wonder why that was. I'm not sure. Maybe not to overwhelm people with too many choices for the first time around. Um, some people already had confusion, so keep it simple graduate from there right yeah that was one of the most fun parts to watch of some of, I, I followed a lot of the progressive conservative nominate leadership nomination mm -hmm. and there was the amount of confusion there yeah because they had a more let's say elderly population yeah i think so and they had a bunch of younger guys that were trying to explain and i mean younger guys that were trying to explain just what the hell this ranked ballot thing was and to watch them try to explain this thing that really requires visuals to explain fully mm -hmm. to a room full of the elderly was it was like a comedy of errors at the uh, election stations here in london if you went in there was um little tester ballots i guess not really but they were demonstration ballots and i believe they had an apple a banana and an orange so it showed you how to rank like first choice second choice third choice with your fruits ah so i don't know if that would have helped or i don't I don't know that necessarily the political or the progressive conservatives needed, quote unquote, help understanding it. But I don't know if that would have made a difference to have that assistive visual. Probably. It would have been something. Because mm -hmm. everybody was confused. I mean, the whole way they ran that nomination procedure was a complete gong show anyway. Uh, at this point, there's so much politics in my brain, I don't even remember how it went down. <laughs> <laughs> so... Basically, it was, so it, was, it was really crazy because there were some people that signed up at the last minute and they need you needed a registration code in order to be able to vote mm. on the leadership but some people didn't get it in time so they were completely out of luck like it was a total nightmare oh wow i did yeah i remember that to some extent but it's been a lot of politics in my life over the last couple of months yeah what got what made you decide this is the path i want to go down i want to get involved and do some campaigning like just aside from taking a lawn sign or something like that. When I was in my third, going to my third year at Western, I took a program over the summer for campaign management from one of the local political um, think, think tanks. And it was really, really interesting. It was a two day program, but you got a little bit of knowledge on volunteer management, some finances, organization, just a bunch of different sides of politics that you don't see so much in the classroom. Although King's does now have a campaign management program, which is really cool. A lot of the students um, were helping out on campaigns for the municipal season. 
So I took that program, found it really interesting, found it very engaging because campaigns are really kind of the first step of politics. That's your first engagement with your soon to be constituents or hopefully to be constituents. Um, or if you're already an elected official to reconnect with them. And then it just gives you a really good chance to be out in the community, to hear from them and to get uh, an understanding of where they want you to represent. So I just thought that that was really neat and kept going from there. That's cool. <laughs> now for that, I didn't know that Kings actually had that program for campaign management. It just started this year. This year? Yeah. So Ooh. far as I know. So groundbreaking. Mm -hmm. And that targets the municipal level or does it cut across all the different levels? I think it cuts across all of the different levels because what you learn in one applies um, to all of them, generally speaking. But we had two girls actually from that program on our campaign as um, student, uh, yeah, student volunteers. But uh, Western has been developing a program and Kings and Brescia and all the affiliates where it's called community engaged learning. And they place students with actual organizations or individuals in the city to get sort of like co-op experience. And I find that that's a really meaningful program. I mentor another group for CEL and I was actually a CEL student the year before I graduated. And that transitioned into the entire ferry project. <laughs> yes, which we'll get to in a few minutes. Yeah. And CEL, just to fully define the acronym is... Sorry, Community Engaged Learning. Community Engaged Learning, got yeah. it. So kind of like an internship, but just in the community? Yeah, so you're still graded within your program, and each of them are structured differently, but there's usually parameters for going out, and it could be two hours a week, and you have to meet with them, uh, your mentors, and it could be a variety of projects. Actually, technically, my CEL project was with the city, it was a different community project that led to the ferry. But yeah, it gets you in. Um, you can network with people. You can understand the process of what you're actually going to be doing professionally beyond just classroom theories. Um, and it tests your skills a little bit and it gives you a lot of opportunity for growth. So I think that that's really important for new students. No or be new graduates rather. Well, yeah, you get you come out of the gate with some experience. Mm -hmm. In that program... Was there a lot of, say, pairing up uh, more conservative-leaning students with more liberal-leading candidates and vice versa? Like, did they mix up the political spectrum a little bit? For the, municipal, or for the campaign management one, the students just reached out to the candidates that they wanted to volunteer with. Okay, cool. Yeah. That's... And then the campaign teams would like decide from then on, as you would for any other volunteer group. Sure. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. What about the technology in campaigns? Like, how much tech is there being used on the municipal level? On the municipal level, I'm not really so sure. Um, we didn't use a whole lot. Uh, you can do a lot with just campaign sheets, um, going door to door, doing analog notes. It is nice to have software that helps organize some of that, but we didn't get too deep into the software and things. That for us, it was more just keeping ourselves organized. Um, but there are campaigns, especially when you get into more provincial or federal levels where there's a lot more money, that people will be using tablets at door to door. They'll have automatic phone machines that'll dial the next caller while you're on the phone with the person before you. Um, and it really depends candidate to candidate. Not everybody uses those. Not everyone budgets for them. But there's emerging tech in the political sphere. Lots of emerging tech. I haven't used too too much of it, so I have a half knowledge. <laughs> So it sounds like it's still a fairly analog process at the municipal level still. Yeah. Um, and that makes sense with funding restrictions and things that you don't want to be spending a lot of money on software subscriptions when you could be getting lawn signs. Sure. Or having an event. What are the spending limits? I forget for London off the top of my head. Um, I was doing research on a lot of the different cities for a different project. So all of the numbers are together now. They're, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> they're all in a big jumble. Yep. Isn't it like, aren't there some really low personal limits? Like you can, an individual can donate like a thousand bucks max or something. I don't want to speak on what I don't know. I know that there's sure. that in a lot of areas, but I'm re really not sure for London at this point. No, fair enough. Fair yeah. enough. It's something it, folks go Google it. <laughs> Just do our job for us and leave it in the comments or something. Ooh, look at that community interaction. Ooh. I'm starting to learn how to do this podcast thing. <laughs> Fascinating. Wow. 
And your candidate won. Yes. Josh Morgan won. He did. Excellent. So he's ready to serve. Now, was he's been on city council before, right? Yes, he's done one term before, so this will be his second. This will be his second term. So you got him... You had a tough job of getting him reelected, so congratulations on that. Oh, well, thank you. We had a fantastic team. I had a campaign co-chair named Rebecca. She was amazing. Everybody on the team really came together and did so much, um, genuinely for a great candidate. So helping oversee all of that, really, the team did most of it. That's sweet. (laughs) When you have a great team, it's easy to keep them organized. (laughs) Oh, hell yeah. No, the team makes the difference, doesn't it? Yeah. That's awesome. So congratulations on that, getting your candidate elected. So there you go. Amanda McNev is the person you want to hire if you want to get elected, clearly. But you had mentioned the fairy pod mother stuff. Yes. Which, and there's, that is selling it so short, fairy pod mother stuff. Because there's a lot. Tell me about it. So in short, I have a whole secondary persona, which is a fairy. And this fairy goes out and she has in her bag things called pad pods and they have a pad and two tampons in them and then just a little description of what it is so people know when they pick it up Um, and it's in just a little jar or baggie but they go out into public places so it could be park bathrooms it could be by needle drop boxes it could be in malls just anywhere where there's people and especially vulnerable people who may not be able to access pads and tampons all the time in the case of an emergency Um, if you get your period out and about you have to deal with it in the moment you can't put it off, but not everywhere has access to just single use items. Um, the bathroom may have a vending machine, which may or may not be working. So if you need something in the moment, a lot of times you'll go out and just purchase a new box. But if you're somebody of like a precarious circumstance or you're a more vulnerable individual, that might be your whole food money for the day to go buy like a six, seven dollar box of pads. So the idea is that the pad and two tampons helps get you through, at least until you can get home or get back to wherever your personal items are, um, and just saves you not having uh, all the problems associated with either not getting something to absorb your flow or having to pay for a whole box and then not be able to do anything with it. Or transport that whole box, because it's not like they're that portable. No, some of the boxes are pretty bulky. I put them in a backpack, but that you know presumes that you have a backpack with free space and you're not carrying a bunch of other things for a long period of time. So all of those things where you're like, oh, it's not that big of a deal. Well, it's not that big of a deal to a person with my circumstance. Sure. But it is a really big deal to people that are you know not as privileged. Sure. How are you funding this? There was a run of t-shirts originally. Um, And then a lot of it's people just donate boxes of pads and tampons to me. I work out of Innovation Works, so people will drop them off sometimes down at the front desk. Other times it's just girls who will be like, hey, by the way, I picked an extra box up and I just wanted to give you them, fill some pads, uh, fill some pods. So it's a lot of just kind of community coming together and then um, putting them together. They're not too, uh, too super expensive. Sometimes I'll put some of my own money in, obviously. But yeah, it's... They're not too expensive to make, so that's nice, but they're meaningful when they're out there. Sure. Did I see a picture of you leaving one of those on the steps of Parliament Hill? Yes. Um, So I actually got to bring them into Parliament. They had to check them through the security machines and everything and had to open it up and show the jar to make sure that it wasn't anything you know nefarious. Makes sense. Um, But yeah, I went up to Ottawa, and the furthest I've gone now is um, Gatineau, Quebec, to do oh, nice. Yeah. So I went up there um, as a graduation trip, actually, because political science student, Ottawa, political capital of the country. Um, it was a really great experience. And bringing them into Parliament Hill, people definitely had looks of concern. But overall, they were happy with the idea of it. And they were like, all right, just bring them in. <laughs> looks of concern. Well, if you're bringing in a jar or anything into a political capital building or things like that. There's always just the security concern of what exactly is that? What's inside? Um, And while you can see into it, like it's clear, the pads and tampons did have a really decorative pattern on them. So they didn't look like pads and tampons. Mm. So they were just like, could you open these? 
And then other people, when I'm like pulling out pads and tampons in the security line, kind of give you the look of like, what is this person doing? <laughs> Why are they trying to bring these in? Yeah, because I suppose that's more of an intimate product to be carrying around or being or, or shown in public. Yeah. Like I think as, you know, from the position of a guy, that's not something that is a normal part of my everyday life. I've had those conversations with a lot of guys out on the street. Um, a lot of people will come up and talk to me because they don't know what I am when I'm dressed as a fairy. <laughs> they're, they're just like, oh, you look lovely. And I'm like, oh, thank you. I'm the fairy pod mother. And as soon as like, oh, what's that? You've caught them. They yep. can't walk away now. It would be rude. Yep. So you can give the guy the entire explanation and they just have to accept that you're now telling them about tampons and giving them a pad pod. And ah, <laughs> and now they get to feel all uncomfortable and ah. deal with the reality that women have to deal with. And you shouldn't be uncomfortable. It's a normal thing. And put your pad pod out somewhere where a female friend can find it or make use of it. Um, yeah, I've had lots of guys actually take them. Lots of guys are actually very supportive once you kind of frame the whole issue for them. And they're like, I didn't realize that you know, that's like a legitimate concern. And it's not even just a concern for vulnerable people. Plenty of us have forgotten our items before we've gone out or got hit unexpectedly. Not having products is really a matter of, it concerns your dignity, it can concern your healthcare, it can concern your job. So having just better access to that is one of the things that really drives me. Makes perfect sense. Yeah. And I mean, it also starts removing some of the stigma around menstruation and periods and all that too. Because mm -hmm. it is, it's a function of our bodies. It's not something that should be stigmatized in any way. It's just, it's something that happens, isn't it? Yep. Spoiler alert, the women in your life, it happens once a month to them. <laughs> <laughs> For quite a while. Yeah. So, you know, get used to it. It's not, I, I, I find it fascinating that we're in the 21st century. We know as much as we do and we're as advanced as we are. And yet there's still so much stigma around people's bodies. Yeah. I can't really, I don't know. It's, I can understand it to some degree when some people are just uncomfortable with any kind of reckoning of like bodily function. But at the same time, it's natural and that's not even just periods. Like there's so many things about bodies that people still have really strong opinions on how they should be. Um, and even to think back to you did your live stream a little while ago about defects. Oh, the birth defect live stream. Yeah. Yes. That there's still as advanced as we are specific perceptions of what a body should be like or what it should function like or what we don't talk about how it functions. And there's just still that ideal. Yeah. Quote unquote. Well, now we're getting into really weird territory with genetic editing. Have you heard of this technology called CRISPR? I've heard of it. I am not versed in it. So CRISPR is really sweet, but it's also kind of terrifying. Okay. Basically, the idea is we can actually use it to edit and manipulate genes. So edit stuff in and edit stuff out. The mm. big fear of it is we can use it to make designer babies. The counter argument to that is... Basically, for every modification, there's some sort of a side effect. Yeah, it's like, fair. It's like the character editor in, in Elder Scrolls Skyrim Square. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best way yeah. to describe it. But one of the discussions that's going on is that it could theoretically be used to edit the genes that are known to cause issues such as Down syndrome. Okay. Or other neurological diseases or other conditions, say, that you live with for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. And the discussion that's starting to happen there is, well, hold on a second. If we're suddenly able to edit out the genes that, I, that cause something like Down syndrome, are we saying that we're editing out Down syndrome? Like, is that something we should be doing? That's where my thought was going, was that gets really into some subjective territory of what do you think is... Um, like too much of an illness or too much of a disability to consider living with. And then what does that say about the people that are living with it now? For instance, Down syndrome was one that you brought up. I've met people across a spectrum of um, like really high functioning people with Downs and less so, and they're still great people. 
some of them are the most kind, hardworking, like creative people I have met. Oh yeah. So then to say that we should be editing out what causes that they're still fulfilled people. So who are we necessarily to select which traits are good or bad? And then that gets into the whole humans have a bad history of trying to erase certain parts or certain genes and create other stronger iterations of human. You don't say. <laughs> so this just sounds like that with the, a technological advanced leaning. <laughs> it's that with lab coats, is it? I think they had lab coats before to be technical, but... Yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, we had lab coats when we were scooping out people's brains with a spoon. I'm just saying. You know, it's I'm, not what you wear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. We don't have good answers to this stuff, though. Like, our politicians are not... I don't feel like our politicians are focusing on these issues. I don't know if that's an issue that a politician could even answer. That It's a huge ethics issue. And I, I don't even know who would be qualified to make those judgment calls. Presumably people with more of a medical background rather than just a philosophical dislike of a group. But again, even a medical professional, if they can isolate what causes something, doesn't really measure the response or the worth of the person that still has that concern. They can mm -hmm. just identify it. Exactly. So, so that's a very slippery ethical slope that I don't know who you would go to to even start answering that. And the other question is, what if, say, we edit out that gene, or we edit out the genes that cause Down syndrome, does that cause some undesired effect 50 years, 100 years, 200, 500, 1,000 years down our evolutionary, evolutionary chain, mm. where we then realize, oops? Yeah, that's a risk that I don't, again, I don't even know where you'd begin to assess that, because that's such a transition down so many generations. And even within the first generation that gets that particular section of their genetics changed. How do we make sure that that isn't causing something else? Yeah. Just editing out one thing. I'm, I'm not a deity, so I can't create people, but that seems like it's a very fine process. Yeah. And removing one part of a human. I don't know what would do to the next part of it. God only knows if there is one who knows. <laughs> yeah that just feels like dicey territory when mm -hmm. we start talking about editing out certain genes yeah it's, it really is i'm happy just to let people be who they are well in the medical community when they talk about birth defects and birth conditions or medical conditions mm -hmm. i was thinking about this the other day and well you saw it in that live stream and i was talking about the fact that when I was in a, that uh, charity spin class, and at one point the instructor said, to get more power, put your, to point your toes down and point your heel up so your foot is in a uh, diagonal position. And at that moment I realized, oh, hold on a second, because of my tight tendons, I do that naturally. Like pedaling flat-footed is freaking weird for me. So it's what was considered a birth defect and something that, not a birth defect, but what was considered a defect and was attempted to be repaired at some point would have actually made me an incredible, has made me an incredible cyclist. And it's like, okay, well, that's, well, if I look at other situations, like my poor eyesight, I've got not so great eyesight. You've probably, you've got glasses. So I do. I have the lenses. You've got lenses. So I don't know how, if your eyesight's good or bad. Mine's pretty terrible. But one of the nice parts is, like, when I go to the gym, I'm part of the YMCA and I've got a Men's Plus membership, which it's that's 18 plus. What's nice about that is I can choose to experience that locker room experience in high definition or not. <laughs> If you catch my drift, <laughs> I can choose to experience that in high definition. The people with good vision, they have to experience that in high definition. <laughs> There's always a silver lining. Yes. And I was just like, oh man, I can take my eyes off and just like not have to deal with any of that nonsense. My, uh, my eyesight's not very good. And to kind of come off of that story, when I was in high school, I went on a ski trip to Quebec with my class and it was a really good time. But 
when we were going up the ski lift right before our first black diamond run, my glasses kept fogging up. So I pulled my ski goggles off and in the process, it caught under my lenses. So they dropped off the ski lift and I can't really see that well without my glasses. So I made it down the black diamond. Thankfully, didn't fall, didn't anything. Found the glasses without the lenses. Um, and I was panicking as like an 11th grader may when they realize that they're now blind in a different speaking different language speaking province for a week but i found that when i didn't have my glasses because i was no longer able to read signs or things i had to ask people in that little uh, village area like hey where am i going can you point me in the right direction Mm. or where is this thing can you describe what it looks like generally because i can't see the details so in breaking my glasses that i had a much more language intensive experience in quebec because i couldn't just rely on vision and you know walk silently past all of the people right you had to actually engage your other senses mm-hmm. that's awesome yeah luckily i had a friend that was also a fantastic guide for most of that week but yeah it was really great just talking to people more and it was a good conversation starter why are you like why can't you see it? well let me tell you yeah <laughs> Probably got really good at telling that story in French. Yeah. I don't know that I could now. I'm a little out of practice, but... I need to go to Quebec more. Yeah. I love that province. It's so beautiful there. Really, it is. We went to Montreal, and then we went up to um, St. Donat, which beautiful, both of them. And I wish I could have just been there longer. Yeah? Yeah. So much to see. When are you planning on going back? Hmm. Probably next year. Hoping to actually go see one of the carnivals. Oh, dude, you have to go and see that. Yeah, so I think next year is my plan. Have you done the skating on the Rideau yet? No. Do I it. do that this year. Oh, it's so neat. Yeah. Although, one word of advice. Okay. Keep your phone in an inside pocket close to your body. Did you fall and break your phone against the ice? No. What happens is if it's exposed to the cold and wind long enough, mm-hmm. the battery will actually start to freeze and the phone will shut down. Oh, yeah. Fair. So the phone and my phone didn't actually start working again until I got inside and warmed it up for a little while. Yeah, I've had that happen. Which is fantastic. Yeah. Oh, I thought you had an experience of shattering it or something. Oh, I used no, to do I've ice had skating, that. So. I've, I've had that too. Uh, my last day in Finland, I dropped my phone. <sighs> I had, oh, it was the worst. I had a beautiful Nokia 1090 or 1020 and it had this crazy 42 megapixel camera on it it was it was like a camera with a phone bolted on is how i described it but it was i was there it was my last day i was getting changed i knock it off the counter and it falls onto the tile floor like on the corner of it so it just the corner gets smashed and the screen was just totaled yep that is the worst spot for it to hit on most phones yeah it's just so vulnerable there. Well, and then that was your last day in Finland. So then were you flying back without a phone or anything? I was, so it was my final, as in my final day, I was flying back that very day. Yeah. So I basically wrapped my phone in a, I had a Ziploc bag with me. Mm. So I was able to wrap the phone in a Ziploc bag. And um, <laughs> for those of you playing the home game, my cat is currently attacking <laughs> is currently attacking Amanda's arm. Why are you doing this? I'm really agitated about these hair elastics. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh dude, God. why? He is just he's not letting up. <laughs> just kick him off your lap if he's being a dick. Sorry, buddy. There we go. Knock it off, man. Don't, we're trying to record a podcast and be all professional here, and there you go, just biting people. Normally, he doesn't do that. That's crazy. Psst, get out of here. I'm okay with it. I love cats. <laughs> yeah, he does this. This is just a typical everyday thing. This is a podcast with cats. What other podcasts have cats? Not many, do they? That could be a whole angle for you. Yeah, it could be. The mm. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, um, you've met Daniel Carles of uh, V Arcadia, right? Yes, sir. Oh man! So one of the other episodes we did when he took he took us through a guided meditation mm. at the start of his episode. As he's going through this guided meditation up there on the printer, and I'm pointing over the printer in my office for those playing the home game. 
I had stacked a whole bunch of name badges. And so we're in this really somber, silent moment. Daniel's taking us through this guided meditation. He's got that voice, yeah. that awesome, you know, meditation, you know, just yogi voice. It's just awesome. And I can see Zach out of the corner of my eye stepping up onto the printer and about to knock everything over. And then, and then bang. Cat, got to interrupt a good thing. Yeah. Daniel, thankfully, was a really good sport about it and just kept a little bit longer silent so I could just splice that yeah. crashing out. <laughs> and for those, if uh, for you who haven't met Dan, he is a wonderful meditation guide. Shout out to the London Mindfulness community. Had to drop that in for you, Dan. Yeah. London Mindfulness community is awesome. And they've got the mindfulness challenges coming up. Yes, they do. When is that? I want to say this weekend. <gasps> Maybe I'm wrong. Oh, no. Don't tell me it's this weekend. I hope it's not this weekend because I'm supposed to be out of town this weekend. I can find out. Oh, no. Because I really wanted to go to that. It'll be in the announcements in the show anyway, and it will also be in the show notes, so you can go check it there and fact check us. Perfect. We'll look it up for then. Exactly. Hey, you've got bad phone service in here, don't you? Yeah, a little bit. Great. I love when that happens. This apartment's got a bit of a uh, cell phone service map. You're in one of the dead zones. It is what it is. Yeah, it's pretty great. At least I still have the phone. It's not shattered like Finland. Yes, that's true. That is very true. Are you involved in Mindful's community at all? I've gone out to a couple of their meditations um, down at Moksha Yoga. Oh, so was Moksha. I think it's now Moto Yoga downtown. Um, and I've gone to yeah, a couple of different ones and they've all been pretty fantastic. Some of them have been very, I found emotionally moving. Other ones have been very, very soothing. So it's a really great community. On Sundays, they have a longer meditation session, which you go for your meditation at the beginning and then everyone or not everyone, you can leave if you'd like, but there's a portion afterward where people share what they experienced during it, what they liked, if they you know grew from something. And it's really amazing to hear the reflections immediately in the moment and even see like the physical reactions in people, whether that's them being very, very relieved of prior stresses or them coming to terms with something that they emotionally have been burying for a long period of time. It's kind of a moment of vulnerability but it's vulnerability in the best way. Yes. So that's what I loved about it. It was mm -hmm. just that chance to go oh, you've through. Been? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> it was one of, I forget the specifics of what we were covering in the one that I went. I can't remember them. I just remember walking away and just going, I, I actually, it was, it was such an emotional experience for me. I remember I actually walked back to my car and started crying because mm. it was that powerful. To be honest, I cried during my first London mindfulness meditation as well. Really? Yep. Wow. It was just very moving, so I had some tears. There's something <laughs> there's something about Good tears. Yeah. Oh yeah, it was good tears. <laughs> <Fair and bye. laughs> yeah. They're not just abusing people. Yeah, they're not just taking a, you know, hot tire iron and hitting against your foot or something. No, it's good tears. It's good emotional tears. Yeah, I found just relieving and just Come on, buddy. For those at home, he's now attacking the water bottle beneath me. Yes. Yeah, that's what he does. He being the cat. Yeah, not, not Elias. Me. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's why we need to do live streaming so that we can have a cat cam. I'm telling you, it's an angle. There we, we go. It. It's literally a camera angle at that point. <gasps> yeah. Amanda just did the uh, like did camera the picture frame. Make two L's with your thumbs yes. and make a portrait. Yeah. We're doing sight gags on a podcast. <laughs> I'm sorry. We've gone here now. We've arrived. <laughs> oh, and it's funnier than it should be because I'm so last night was Mo Monday's Toronto and I'm kind of operating on about four hours sleep right now. <laughs> no worries. So I'm a little bit uh, more giddy than normal. Let's put it that way. A great show though last night. Yeah. Oh yeah. Who was speaking? Uh, we had five really great speakers. One of them was me. Oh, just to, yeah, to add that in. Five really great ones, including me. Including me. No, no that you was, are a great speaker. We'll give you that. I was. I, that was probably the best rendition of. I was telling my story, and that was probably the best rendition. I was really happy with it. Yeah. The one thing that 
all the speakers were really fantastic. We, there was one that she uh, she's seventy five years old, and her uh, her big spiel was the fact that she's moving to South America. Okay, at seventy five years to live by herself. By herself, yeah. no family down there. Nothing. Just... No family. No friends. No nothing. She's just okay. like you know what? I want to go live down here. Do you, girl? Yeah. No kidding. Well, her, and there's her, the title of her talk was There's No Age Limit on Badassery. <sighs> That's inspiring. Oh, I yeah. don't know who you are, but thank you. She is, she is so, so cool. Yeah, she's this, she's a 75-year-old woman. She's written a couple books. Uh, I will check the show notes and see what her name is. I can't remember it off the top of my head. My iPad's too far away to grab. We'll get there. But that's okay. Uh, you might even be as depending on when this show goes up, you might be able to go to the Mo Mondays Toronto page. You know what? Go to Mo Mondays Toronto on Facebook, and you'll be able to uh, look her up. But yeah, all the speakers last night were fantastic. They were just uh, it was it, the whole show flowed really well. There were some funny moments. There were some really deep, touching moments. Uh, just and I was really happy with my own performance. That's awesome. But uh, it. I, I was talking with my friend. Uh, I went up with Wayne Hamilton. Shout out to Wayne. He was on the podcast a few day, a few weeks ago. Mm, yeah. He's. Um, have you met him at all? No, I haven't. I don't think so. Okay, this is this guy is one cool dude. So he's a executive consultant that likes berets. Oh, I like him already. Yeah, very good choices. Good, good choices. Mm -hmm. and he's the author of the one chapter book series. Yeah, I've never heard of that, but that sounds really intriguing. Can you give me a summary? Yes. Okay. The, the summary is he got really tired of reading these self help books and these entrepreneurial books or business books, where he'd get to a certain section and then he w would stop reading because he was like, "Okay, I've got what I need out of this." So he sat back one day and went why don't I write a series of books and just they're one chapter each and they're hyper focused on one item. Okay. That sounds really cool. That sounds like a good idea actually. Oh, it's a It's a phenomenal idea. I picked a, I got a cut. He gave me a copy of his one book. The, he calls it the lucky printer. Okay. I'll check that out. Yeah. And it's all about how do you actually, how do you increase luck in your, um, in your endeavors? Like, is luck just something that's random chance, or is it something that you can kind of manipulate and control? Yeah, like, can you cultivate luck? Yeah, the answer is yes. Okay, spoiler never, alert, guys. Yeah, spoiler alert, the answer is yes. Read the book to find out. <laughs> so, yeah, he's, he's a really cool guy. He's actually done a lot of stuff in the Millennial Network Group, too. Oh, okay. Yeah, he did a business development seminar with them once. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, so he's uh, a little bit older than us, but not by much. Okay still wanting to help out the millennial community and, and develop them, develop their business skills. That's awesome. So I think he's, he's an awesome guy. Sounds so, like it. so him and I went up last night on our way back. We got talking about just all these different speaking events and uh, speaking opportunities. Do you do a lot of public speaking these days? A fair amount. I speak at tampon Tuesdays every so often. Um, doing campaign things is a lot of public speaking. I'm sorry, cat, for the viewers <laughs> at home. I don't know if you just heard that sad meow as he tried to bite me again. Good morning. Um, yeah, I, I really enjoy like speaking to crowds and things. I did performance in high school for music. So when you learn how to sing in front of an audience, you can speak in front of the audience. Ah, yes. At least that's what my high school music teacher told me. And that sold me on the vocal class. So... It I did a, out. <laughs> I did a bit of theater as a kid. Oh, that's so cool. Did you ever do original kids? I did not, but uh, I have friends that did the camps and things over at Covent Garden Market. Oh, I always see their theater and things. You did? I did. You know what? I did it before Covent Garden Market was a thing. Oh, really? That's... Before the before they put the uh, Spirit Kids Theater in there. Mm -hmm. They actually, I think they held it, the year that I did it, they held the summer camp at, I want to say King's College. Okay. And that was, oh man, it was such an epic experience. Yeah, it would be. I think that they did smaller sort of like satellite camps down in St. Thomas, but they weren't nearly as long, but then you would put on like a small production. Um, but the ones in London were always so well done. And yeah. People worked really hard over the summers to 
you know, execute at the end. And I was always just really impressed because I was not so much of a theater kid. And to see in, you'd be people that you knew who were very shy at the beginning, even that by the end were just like confident in their performance. They were confident more out with people because they were like, I can do this. I've demonstrated. Yeah. I can do this. And at such a young age, too. Yeah. The production value of those original kids' performances were insane. Do you know what the like the youngest age is now that you can still do original kids? No. Okay. We'll have to look that up. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you knew and no. I was going to have my mind blown. No, no. It's just I remember some of the kids being like fairly young and just being very, very impressed with where they would get to by the end of the summers. And that speaks to the camp counselors and whatnot that host it. But yeah, there would just be some young kids that would be phenomenal. And I'd be like, where did you come from? How are you so good, so much younger than me? No, that's narcissistic. They're, they're really good. <laughs> but it always bewilders you when you see somebody so little and you're like, you're a prodigy, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, except a lot of it's training. Exactly. You didn't see the... I that's had, the thing, yeah. Yeah, that that was the thing is that it was a lot of training. Like it was, I mean, time memory distorts everything. I feel like it was at least a six week program. Like it spanned most of the summer for me. Yeah, like that's what I'm saying. It's by the end of it, like I knew girls that would come up from St. Thomas to go do it. And every single year by the end of summer, they were almost like a new person. Yeah. Because they like leveled up not only their performing skills on stage, but like I don't I think that you guys did improvising and practice and things like that yeah. because they would try to like teach us other kids how to do it back home. We were not as good. But yeah, just seeing that change and it, yeah, it really has to be training because even though it seems like, wow, you're so good for such a young age, it, that's a matter of dedication and like the hours they put in. Yeah. And just getting on stage. Mm -hmm. there that's was, half the battle. Like the fact that I was on stage at age, I couldn't have been more than seven when I was in original kids. Yeah. I couldn't have been more than seven, but even just at that young age, getting on stage and just getting conditioned and used to it. Like when mm -hmm. I get on a stage now, I feel like I'm back home. Yeah. Like I'm just like, I'm, I'm home. This is where I'm meant to be, which makes me sometimes reconsider some of my career choices because sometimes I feel like I'm meant to actually be on a stage doing more speaking. Just wait, you'll get to the motivational speaker tier and then that will be your career. Oh, good. Then I can be one of those. Never mind. <laughs> Don't say something you'll regret before people will hire you as a motivational speaker. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, because the internet will archive everything. No, there are some. I've met some really, really awesome motivational speakers. There's a lot of really great ones out there. Um, there's I've just having run Mo Mondays. There's you do run into a lot of different personalities. Let's say. Yeah. And I've definitely and running a lot of events. Like I've definitely run into the motivational speakers that are just. Um. I'm I'm looking for a gentle word here, you know, that, that are a little bit, I don't know, let's say full of themselves. Okay. That is just, they're kind of, they're very, very self-important. And the speaking world is a really tricky one. It's a really tricky one to navigate. Is it's, it? Yeah. Oh yeah. Cause you've got, there's quite, there's, I feel like there's a lot of t uh, territorialness to it. Okay, that makes sense. That's kind of, I think, in a lot of performance type arts. Yeah. That people perceive like the market is limited for the opportunities, even if maybe necessarily is or it isn't, but there is that sort of corner that you feel like you fill. And if someone else comes and has a very similar story or similar performance, that, that can feel, rather than opening up to them and being like, wow, we really share this. Yeah. That you almost separate a little further to try to differentiate yourself from that guy or that girl. I find the biggest struggle I have with talking with some speakers is getting them to open up and get out of speaker mode and promotion mode. Very true. I could see that. Because there is a lot of, you know, convincing other people that, yes, I'm the person to hire. I'm the person that will inspire your audience. And to their credit, they know the sentences and phrases that will work and get them booked. Mm -hmm. So I get that to a certain degree. But it, they can be, I found that, they're either some of the easiest people to connect with or some of the most difficult. Well, I think in that situation, that opening up afterward can be definitely from a, uh, or not opening up whichever one you choose to do comes from also a place of vulnerability. So again, if you're territorial, that's one thing, but then when you're in promotion mode, 
you're really trying to put your best self forward. And even though your story may have some things that tell you about your character flaws or things that you've grown from, you don't want to broadcast everything and kind of disrupt that persona. But I also find that a lot of people really do connect with the more genuine, vulnerable speakers. So it's kind of a catch-22 of, are you going to be the vulnerable type? And, um, and that can be very difficult for a person because then any criticism can be a little bit more personal. But it can also really open you up to way better connections, for instance. Oh, yeah. With, like, meaningful humans. Like, any time that I've spoken on any of the different stages I've spoken on, it's, I'm... I'm not up there to fulfill my own. I mean, originally I set out and went, okay, I want to do more public speaking. So I'm going to join Toastmasters and I'll become a public speaker. And, you know, this will be this path that I start to pursue because mm. I want to speak publicly. Yeah, it, I've watched your transition. It, yeah, it had, it did originally start out from a very, let's say, selfish place. But then over time, I've watched. I've studied a lot of different speakers. I've booked speakers for Mo Mondays. I've helped book speakers for big events. And I've realized that speaking is almost the accessory. Like the best speakers I've ever dealt with are ones that are almost speakers second. Yeah. You know, they've got, they've developed themselves, they developed their skill set over time. And they happen to have developed and cultivated the ability to speak to a group of people. So it's like I think about somebody like uh, Jane Blaufus, who she was a big uh, executive in the insurance industry in Canada. But her story was that she, her husband passed away, uh, you know, fairly young, and he didn't have his affairs in order. So sorting all that out was a bit of a nightmare. And it was also a wake up call for her. Because she realized, well, if I'm an insurance executive and my family doesn't have their affairs in order, what does the average person's affairs look like? Yeah. And so she's gone on all sorts of speaking opportunities to different insurance groups and uh, insurance seminars to say, listen, you guys need to serve your clients. Like you need to start having these conversations with people. Mm -hmm. And it's, is she the best? speaker in the world on a technical point i that's debatable you know i'm gonna say you you could always say with any speaker it's you could find somebody better but she's got an incredibly personal and powerful and vulnerable message yeah i mean every time she gets up on that stage she's got to relive that whole experience over again i find that it's almost a means of storytelling in some regard rather than it's the difference between storytelling and like promotion self yeah and when you're telling the story yeah, you're reliving it. You're seeing what you saw before or you're just going back to some of those stronger feelings rather than having kind of, it's almost like the Instagram of public speaking when you've <laughs> curated your story to be like, oh, here's the flaw. But really, it's not the flaw versus like, this is really just what I felt during that moment. And I realized here, this needs to change. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. The speaking world is a really interesting one. It's a hard one to get started in and for good reason. I mean, there's a lot of people that want to become speakers. I'm not necessarily sure they want to, they realize the effort you have to put in because mm. it's like, I've been going to Toastmasters now since 20 early 2016 and speaking on and off on different stages pretty much all my life. Like I've not been a stranger to the stage, but to get to where I am now, has been a process like it's not been, it has not been an overnight thing i've gotten it's taken years to get good yeah it does it really does and i know i've still got a long ways to go so for the average person who's just starting out and going oh i'll be a speaker and that will solve everything it's like mm, probably not probably not you've probably got a long ways to go it's still a craft just because we can all speak in our day to day speaking with meaning and to a large group and you know having a longer story with no notes even that's a whole separate set of skills that it's i can liken it to musical performing where you have to be ready for that performance day and you don't just trip into being able to play a solo right you had to get there 
And everything in a speech is still part of what you've prepared to present to people. Your pacing, your words, your visual aids, anything like that. Really, you have to practice to get yourself yeah, there. And I've seen your evolution from Toastmasters starting oh, probably almost a year ago. Right. Yeah. I don't know how long you've been doing it, if you've been doing it beyond then. But even just over that year, seeing you progress, it's always a skill that always can have another component to improve. Mm-hmm. But I feel like there's this gap where there's Toastmasters, and that's a fantastic environment for finding out what your skills are and how you can improve, and then improving on that and practicing. But then there's this gap between you're in Toastmasters, then there's other public speaking opportunities like a Mo Mondays or Speaker Slam or Tampon Tuesdays or whatever they happen to be. Mm -hmm. Let's call them events. Yeah. And let's even attach something further and say there's something on the line. You've got an opportunity to talk with these people and you really want to make an impact. Of course. What is in between those two stages where you've got your education program and then you've got the big day? Is there anything in terms of practice and feedback that's in between that? I think it depends on what you're going to be speaking about first and foremost. But if there's any way for you to actually be embedded in the topic in which you are going to speak, so say you're going to talk about alcoholism and then you've gone to AA that you've genuinely experienced it and you've had conversations with people um, from your own experience, from their experience, but you come to understand the issue and the topic in a more personal sense. And when you're public speaking, it usually is already personal, but when you get yourself brought back to the roots of it, or for me, um, you know, going out and talking about pads and tampons, uh, volunteering with the food bank, anything like that. It's you're seeing the front lines of what you hope to almost see your outcome be of speaking Mm. when you're speaking, unless you're just speaking to hear yourself speak. Um, a lot of times you do have a message that you want to convey to people and it's understanding how that message can be received by people, um, in those communities really, I think helps you frame when you're going to be speaking on it professionally because you're using the same language in both areas. Um, again, like that really depends on what you're speaking about. Or even if say you're into computers, volunteering with a, you know, local computer co-op or like a gaming co-op or things, you can just get involved in those communities more so. And then speaking becomes more natural and less of that perfectly polished version of yourself. And there is sort of a record of you existing in that sphere. That's not just you on the stage. Mm. So like if I'm at a tampon Tuesday or if I'm in a different meeting, there are people who will know what the fairy pod mother is because she exists outside of just that tampon Tuesday moment. Sure. It's a weird character. You see her out and about. Um, And that makes connecting with people on the issue a little bit more familiar. Mm. So I don't know if that's a perfect interesting so you're piece of assistance but that's right. what i find for you're, me personally you're doing more work in and around the event leading up to it not just yeah so you go from your education section before your performance and it's sort of like an embedded section mm. and that sounds really creepy i don't do my volunteering just to like embed and get experience like i volunteer because i really like volunteering sure but i find that that for me is a a really comfortable and logical stepping stone. Um, And especially because I'm speaking on issues of that affects like vulnerable individuals and things and people that definitely are not in the same spheres of privilege that I am. So I have to make sure that I'm not misrepresenting things and I can't speak for those people. For instance, I can only speak uh, like on the issue and bring light to it. So it really depends on what you're talking about, but interesting. That's that's a different angle that I hadn't considered looking at it. What would you think would be the step between? I was thinking more on the technical side of how do you actually practice and refine that mm. speech? Okay. In a way that's out, in a way that somewhat emulates the environment that you'll be delivering that speech in. Cuz Toastmasters is sometimes that. Yeah. It, but if you're not in a classroom or a really well lit setting, let's mm-hmm. say, then Toastmasters really doesn't is there is a difference between the Toastmaster setting and say, you know, a stage like Mo Mondays or a, a, a motivational speaker stage, let's say. Yeah. So 
I feel like there's that unless you kind of get your own family and friends to participate in something, there's not, there's nothing in between. Okay. I see where you're going with this. Yeah. I went to a totally different angle. Whoops. Which I like, <laughs> I think you came, I think you came up with a really good angle though. That idea of, cause that, that embedding yourself in that community or in that subject, that's how you get that language. And that's how you figure out what's, I know that's the cat again is just, so loving and so violent. I don't get this. He's been fed. He's been fed and he's just doing this. I He's never done this on any other podcast. It's okay. I love him anyways. Yeah. He's just, he just, you know what? He wants those hair elastics or something. Yeah, oh, now it's the cord. You might want to get him off your lap. Yeah. That seems like it's a bad thing. Sorry, buddy. I just, I, I, I see a, I, I see an organic thing with razor sharp claws. <laughs> But getting back to the topic for a second, yeah, um, getting embedding yourself in those communities gives you that vocabulary and gives you the issues that it's like it teaches you how to talk with those people, mm -hmm. and that's something that you don't get with a program like Toastmasters or you know when you're going up if you're graduating immediately to the stage, yeah, you don't have that language. And I was always raised by my parents to speak to the custodian the same way that you speak to a CEO. Yes, and. I've gone through patches where I've been in more vulnerable situations, definitely not vulnerable like what a lot of people deal with, but just times in your life when things are rougher and I can empathize to a certain extent with the struggles of those people. Or when you're doing a motivational speech, a lot of times you can empathize with people because the topic that you're talking on has some significance to you. Yes. Um, so when you're talking to like the average person in that issue, it's sort of like being able to speak to both the highest and the most like humble people and treating them both the same ways. And I find that when I deliver speeches that way, that is a very organic way of speaking, um, makes you understandable and it just humanizes what you're talking about rather than being just like a portrait of the persona you want to display. Sure. The other thing is when you speak, when you use simple language, you actually sound smarter because more people can understand your message. That's why when you write political speeches, you write them into, I think most will write around like a grade six, grade seven age, just to make sure that the language is as clear as possible. Yep. And that's not people sometimes will think that that's to like underestimate the intelligence of your voters or things, but it also makes sense for if you speak or if you're in a like language diverse area, yes, that if I write something that's like a master's level English thesis, that very, very intelligent people just might not speak that level of English. Sure. So writing when you're writing down to a like mid range grade, it just makes it accessible for more people. And even, you know, kids that are listening that want to hear the issue, like it's just a much more approachable way of writing and especially speaking. That was a huge stepping stone for me. The moment that I realized that I was speaking way above my audience. Mm. And what really prompted me to research that was looking at the 2016 election, Trump versus Clinton. Okay. What I did was I actually ended up taking, there's a bunch of these different readability scores. So there's the gunning fog index. There's the something flesh Kincaid. There's a couple of other, there's a couple of them that measure basically grade level. Like you said, yeah, and I ran their speeches, and there's a lot of political researchers that have run their speeches through these different engines. I think they found Clinton on average was like grade 10 to grade 12, and Trump on average was grade 6 to grade 8. I want to say that that's true. I know that that's a reasonable difference that that was found that she spoke a few years above. And then I just don't remember what the exact values were, but he definitely used more like of a common language. And that's not to say that she's a bad speaker by any means. She's a fantastic speaker and very confident in her topics oh yeah um but and i don't know if her changing the language would have made a difference with the political climate but you could definitely just see that different audiences require different patterns of speech and different ways of engaging with their experiences even um and you do in the states and many places will get like an educational divide as well where if you're trying to campaign to um, say the people in Appalachia where it may not have been beneficial for them to finish high school 
way back, way back, and just went to go work in the factories, work in the mines, the same way in St. Thomas. It's not that they're by any means unintelligent. They are incredibly smart people, but they don't need to use poetic language to get their ideas across. And if you can use simple language to get it across, it's like when you can teach someone something, you really know what you're talking about. Yes. So if you can say it in, like, the, explain like I'm five subreddit is one of my favorite places to go. <laughs> if you can, you know, bring your topic or your speech to that and not to like underestimate your audience or disrespect their intelligence, but you make it just so approachable. Yeah. It's, it's easy for them to come to. Yeah. And you just, you become much more liked as a result. I can see this being unfortunate for you because you're so incredibly smart that when you realize I need to tone this down a little, you know what? But I was I fine with changes. it. Changes, but yeah, you're just a very smart person. So I can see how that would be a turning point for you to have to adjust your style a little bit. But what I ended up doing was I built. I have this really awesome tool that I built. It's a Microsoft Word plugin, mm-hmm. and I can run it. When I run it, it will analyze a piece of writing and it will give me a whole bunch of these different scores. So I can measure a piece of writing and it'll tell me what sorts of emotions this paragraph will evoke, what's its reading level. Like I can do a real in depth analysis on it. And you built that? I built that, yeah. Could I borrow it? <laughs> uh, potentially. <laughs> it's available for license, folks. Uh, for all of you who are working on political campaigns, uh, most politicians write way above their constituents' grade level. Just saying. I've run a bunch of speech transcripts. One thing I was trying to discover was, are there, different, are there patterns between people that are influential mm-hmm. and people that fail to influence their audiences? And there are definitely, definitely patterns that you can pick out by running a bunch of these speeches yeah. through this engine. Like I, I managed, it's a word plug-in, but there's a component of it that I can actually just fire, you know, I've got like a hundred speeches on my computer that I just fire through this thing to come up with averages and tweak everything and see, you know, here's influential, here's not so influential, yeah. here's your average scores. And so what I did was I ran this on a whole bunch of political speeches and went, oh, okay, there's a bunch of patterns between people who are influencers and people who are not. And then I thought, what about me? So I took my first Toastmaster speech, my very first Toastmaster speech, the icebreaker. Mm -hmm. I had written it out verbatim. I ran it through the speech engine. And it was like at a college level. That doesn't surprise me with you at all. Yeah. It was at college level or higher. And I was That look- sounds about right. Yeah, and I was looking at it and going, "Oh crap. You know, I've got people in here that some of them may have their high school and I'm completely talking over their heads." Not only that, but because it's so complicated, it requires that much more brain power and processing to store the damn thing in my head. Yeah. And people will take shortcuts when trying to make associations between, and this isn't just for politics, this is for anything, but they'll make association jumps between certain words or certain phrases. um, And the more obscure that the term becomes to them, the more that it requires a refined definition, the more space people have to misinterpret or reinterpret what you're trying to say to them. Whereas if your language is simpler and clearer, and you're just explaining the idea rather than like a very like long poetic means to it that if people disagree, the conversation is clearer and easier to have because you're not arguing like semantics. Yes. And then you're not losing your audience. Like they may be engaged and you start using language they don't really quite get and they'll have to follow through with that and not be where you are in the speech anymore. They're trying to make sure like, oh, did I, I got that angle right, right? That's what they meant. Yeah. And English is a tricky language to begin with. Written English and spoken English are two very different beasts. Yes, very much so. And it, that's something I have conversations with other Toastmasters all the time. Yeah. Spe- beginning, beginner Toastmasters fall into a trap very frequently. They will write out their entire speech. And inevitably, you can tell that they've written the speech when they deliver it. Because it's... Spoken English, there is a certain crudeness to it that if you actually, if you read written passages, it's, I mean, you have to take a lot of breaths. There's a lot of 
there it actually a, a lot of written English sounds very awkward when read out loud. Yes. But a lot of spoken English, and I've transcribed a lot of my spoken English, I look at it on the page and go, what the hell is that? Like it looks like some monkey had a hammer and just was hitting the autocorrect button on my iPhone. <laughs> but it's, it is a trap that, and I've fallen into that trap too, of writing it down and then trying to de- deliver it. And inevitably, you never deliver the speech the same way twice. No. Um, and that's... That's actually one of the points of why I find embedding yourself so beneficial. Because when I speak, I'll have a couple of points that I know that I want to hit on, and those will be what I practice. But if you know those points so well that if someone came up to you in a coffee shop, tapped you on the shoulder and said, hey, could you explain this really quick, that you have what you'd say. Yes. You know it well enough. Um, then when you go up and speak about it, you're just speaking from a place of experience a place of knowledge rather than a place of performance yes or there's a place where you can at least perform a little bit oh yeah i'm not undermining performance at all it's a huge part yeah once you learn how to effectively incorporate that and just turn up the drama just a little bit Mm -hmm. you can make that memory really stick in people's heads yeah but in terms of kind of taking off the edge of someone who's really new to public speaking is if you can deliver those points off the top of your head out of the blue then that's when you can start refining the performance aspect because it's now focusing on how you deliver those points, not yes. making sure that you have the points. Yes. So when I ran that speech through the speech analyst, it was, I think the gunning fog was around 90 or a hundred and to reach 70 to 80% of your audience, you want to target like 70. Mm. So I got the editing pen out and just started tweaking and fiddling and editing. And by the time I was all said and done, I ran the revised version through the engine and I had taken it from 90 on average down to 65. Nice. Without losing the meaning. So that was no, I had not added or deleted any content. I had just tweaked the language. And by just tweaking the language, I made it that much more accessible. And did you find when you after you wrote it and were reading through it, um, when you spoke it out, even when you were practicing, did you find that it felt more natural? A hundred percent. And then that becomes easier to deliver. If, and especially if you're someone like you, where you speak at a very high level naturally, that it's almost relaxing to be able to tone it down and be like, I don't have to present this as technically as I know it. Like, I can kind of engage the audience and just sort of I sometimes public speaking is almost like playing with your audience you can read them and you're delivering information and experience to them but if you're speaking down a level even it's just can flow so much more naturally and you don't have to have everything planned out perfectly you're just it's so much more organic I think and I'd rather come up with an idea that I can express it a couple of different ways. Mm-hmm. When you simplify the language, it opens up your options. Definitely. When you're using very complex language, you're now relying on your ability to remember a specific word or a series of specific words in a particular order. Yeah. And if you can't remember that, your delivery is thrown. Yeah, the higher specificity, again, um, that relies... A- on perfectly articulating that specificity. Um, and that's not to say obscuring your topic is better, but sometimes there's just no need to be so particular. Yes. It makes you anxious and can confuse your audience. Take a breath, exist, speak. Yeah. Pause. <laughs> Pause. Holy crap. Pause. That was, that was another huge revelation when I realized that the power of the pause yeah, it. I remember actually when I was, I guess I would have been, wow, I'm, I'm dating myself in like the eighth grade when Obama ran. And my teacher used to play his speeches and show like, look, this is where he just stops. This right. is where he lets words, even if he doesn't finish a thought, you know, he lets the thought hold and sort of let the audience think what their autocorrect is going to be. Then he delivers his part to it. Yes. And that can just, that's where it's sort of playing with your audience. Like you're letting their minds get engaged. You're not just lecturing to them. 
having left academia recently, <laughs> you can talk at an audience for three hours. Yes, you can. That doesn't mean they're listening. <laughs> no, it doesn't. That was my favorite part when I was doing my master's degree. That was my favorite part of any of those courses was doing the presentations because everybody else would use this very precise academic English and blah, 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 blah. And in conclusion, we found that blah, 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 whatever. And nobody would listen. And then I'd go up there with my simple refined English and go, here we go. <laughs> I'm like, I'm the redneck at an academic convention. Let's do this. That's really relatable to my presentation um, at the end of, before I graduated, um, for the project that became the ferry, was I wasn't sure exactly how to deliver a t presentation on running like a fundraiser and a t-shirt line for period products to like a group of city officials and academics. And I'm like, mm, look at all these professionals. I'm about to talk about menstrual blood. Right. So when I presented it, I was like, there's no way I can present this as seriously as I can present other like academic topics. Like it's just going to feel even more weird right. than what it was. Um, so in that particular speech, it is the only time in my academic career, and it will be the only time uh, in which I had to sort of strip during part of it because I wore <laughs> the t-shirt that I was going to, like that was the t-shirt line underneath of a like very nice blouse, or I guess not a blouse, but a nice, a very nice dress shirt, but I had a zipper up the back. So part of uh -huh. my whole speech was like leading up to having to like turn away from my audience and like unzip my shirt. And it was not a seductive unzipping. It was like a very business undoing. But to get to that point, I knew I could not be really serious and be like, and therefore, one moment. I'll Zip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I went up and presented. And I had different challenges in my uh, project where the period project was not at all what I started. What I started did not end up working. And I had like two months left, so I had to reconfigure a whole project do something so when i was speaking about it it's like i still have to speak about what did not go well mm. and talking about what you fail at really professionally and then trying to take off a shirt to show people a shirt that says grow a pair <laughs> on it you really have to realize you can't start at like a university graduate level and work down to that <laughs> it just gets <laughs> weird <laughs> yeah i can see that I can see. So this now very pod mother came mm -hmm. out of a research project that you did at Western, right? So it wasn't a research project for this one. I did two community projects. One was research okay. with the city. And then the other one was for a um, women in civic leadership course, which was a fantastic program where they would take you had to apply to it. And they would take, I think in my year, we had 15 female students and they would partner you with a mentor in the community. And I was very, very fortunate to be partnered with Jane Roy, who's a co-director at the London Food Bank. Oh, yeah, yeah. Amazing person. Amazing person. So I was partnered with her, and that's how I ended up going to Tampa on Tuesdays. I got exposed to the Business Cares Food Drive, so many great initiatives in London. Mm. Um, so I was originally going to run a food drive for the food bank because the food bank is always in need of donations of baby formula. So if you're considering donating, especially because the holiday season is coming up, all donations are appreciated. Baby formula is really really appreciated they're always low what are the top three items that they're always low on <clears throat> baby formula would be one um i want to say pads and tampons just because there's something that you don't think about because you can't eat it right sure and i'm not sure what i would put for the third to be honest fresh fruits and vegetables are always good but those are harder to donate that's easier when you have like a sponsor to donate those sure donate non-perishables if sure. at all possible um Especially during big food drives, because mm. if you put something fresh and it goes into one of those giant bins, it's very hard to find it afterward, uh, but we have yeah. to. Yeah, so yeah. do us a favor. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Non-perishables, please. Um, but so I was trying to run that food drive and things were going along well and it was the first really large event I had been trying to run, but there was some issues with venue and then a second venue that I was going to go to ended up getting sold very shortly beforehand so rather than trying to renegotiate kind of like the terms with the new owners and things i was like let me just walk away from this 
because the return on investment and the return on effort isn't going to be productive as well for the food bank where I could use the resources I still have for another two months and come up with something smaller but different. So I've been going to the Tampa on Tuesdays. I went, I think, every one of them since October in that year. Um, and there was a woman named Mandy Fields there. She runs them. She's been running them for quite a while. And another girl, she's a uh, radio host here in London, uh, Rachel Edinger. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Here for her. Yeah. So it was seeing them and talking to them and things where all these donations and things were coming in, which is fantastic. Um, but there were still kind of gaps where it was like, well, what do you do? in the moment like you can go get the donations from the food bank nobody will prohibit you there's lots of uh, locations that get supported by the food bank in london i think 25 but it was like that in the moment you're downtown where do you go Mm. so it started off as a little bit different iteration um where it was pad boxes and then do you know um he he runs the reimagine store downtown I don't think so. So he also runs an event called 101 Day here yes, in London. Yes, I've so, heard of that. Okay. So for those of you who don't know what 101 Day is, this is my best summary without having a summary of it, is it's to make your city a city of neighbors mm-hmm. and different organizations and groups and individuals will contribute something to the day to make it more community friendly. Whether that's people washing your car for free or... If it's people writing poetry for you in Vic Park, um, he reached out to me during a socialpreneur chat down at Innovation Works and was like, you should do something on 101 Day. And at that point, I was like, what the heck can you do that's neighborly with pads and tampons? I don't really know. I had never thought of it. So I I'd originally bought this dress maybe two months beforehand in Toronto, and I had absolutely no reason to have bought it other than I was like, this is beautiful. (laughs) So I realized I was like, Oh, I could take that dress and like, I could go give out pads. Um, and I was originally going to call it pad bombing. Like if you've ever seen yarn bombing where they, um, knit around like tree trunks or fire hydrants. And it's like that's yarn graffiti. There's a, there's a neighborhood not far from where we are. Mm -hmm. So Columbia Ave and all that area, just by uh, Eagle Heights elementary school there by Cherry Hill mall. Yeah. They've, if you look at all the signposts, they've been doing that. Oh, They're awesome. All, like one of the signposts is actually wrapped. It looks like it was one of the minions. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, it's beautiful. They're so cute. Yeah. There used to be, um, I think there was a program here in London, not a program, but an organization that was called Yuck for like young underground Canadian knitters that would do that. <laughs> but so I wanted to call it uh, pad bombing. And then I had a realization that putting out little jars that you can't see into and calling it bombs and being like hashtag bombing Toronto hashtag bombing parliament building would probably not be a wise marketing angle. I don't see anything wrong with it. If you don't, (laughs) I was like, I don't want to be put on any watch lists for this. Uh, so I realized like I could call it a fairy pod instead of a bomb. Or I could call it pad pod. And that's where I was like, wait, I had this dress. I was going to go out pods. I could be a fairy pod mother. Bam. Nice. Bam. So I had to go get wings. <laughs> and yeah, I've broken so many pairs now. <laughs> um, and I thought it was going to be for one day. I was like, I'm going to swallow my pride. I'm going to get the silly character on. Like, I'm going to go be Tinkerbell. It's stuck. (laughs) (laughs) She still exists now. Nice. Just more of my life. (laughs) It's your alter ego. It is. So when's the Fairy Pod Mother's podcast going to come out then? I've actually thought about it because Pod leans into it. It's the perfect marketing line. Perfect. The Fairy Pod. The Fairy Pod. Yeah. The Fairy Pod. Nobody take that. I'm going to copyright this real quick. The Fairy Pod. We got it. We'll trademark it. Before you go, we're, we'll register that domain for you. Perfect. We'll park it. The fairy pod. That's all. <laughs> Do you have fairypodmother.com or anything like that yet? Not yet. Okay. We got to make sure we get you that stuff. Yeah. Because that's like, that's marketing gold right there. The fairy. So actually the fairypodmother.com does not exist. Uh, it's not what exists, but you can't buy it. Um, it is a dolphin photographer. What? Because dolphins travel in pods. Oh. So she's a dolphin photographer. Well, isn't that something? 
shout out to the fairy pod mother down i guess in south u.s i would presume wherever the dolphins are yeah wow that's well i mean that's at least it's not somebody else who's doing what you're doing no i just thought it was cool and it's a yeah. you know cool little side story no there's kidding. other fairy pod mothers out there we're just very different yes wow although so, if she wants to collab we could shout out to the other fairy pod mother hey there you go do a collaboration <laughs> that'd be sweet I'm not sure how you'd collaborate, but hey, what the hell? I don't know. I like dolphins. We'll figure it out. Just wrap those, wrap the pod kits around the dolphins. I have no idea. That seems mm, I don't dangerous. know. That'd be cruelty. Yeah. That seems bad somehow. <laughs> uh, <laughs> never mind. That's not such a good idea. Don't wrap things around dolphins. Please don't. Leave them alone. They're beautiful animals. We don't condone this behavior. Any uh, actions taken by the audience, we are not legally accountable for. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> thank you for the disclaimer. Uh, there's one day there will be more legal disclaimers. I'm sure <laughs> I was thinking about that one the other day. I'm just like, should I be putting more legal disclaimers and waivers and crap like that in place? Or is it a small podcast? So who gives a shit right now? I think we're good. My, uh, disclaimer there was not professional legal ease, but yeah. we're not responsible for whatever you do as an adult. Let's put it that way. Yeah. And if you're a child, your parents are responsible for you. Yeah. So do whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> Make the world a better place. Because it will be hilarious one day. <laughs> I'm just going to stand by. Do what you want. Make the world a better place. Yeah, exactly. Just do that. That's that's hilarious that the fairy pod mother started off as a one-off thing, though. Entirely. Yep. I... And I was like, I was somewhat kind of shy about going out. And I was like, oh, people are going to see this and they're going to wonder, like, what is this human doing? I mean, they still do. You can definitely see that on people's faces sometimes. It's a, it's a mixed bag of like, oh, this girl looks pretty and is doing something neat versus like almost repulsion of like, what's wrong with this girl? <laughs> <laughs> but people remember you that way. They do. Like everybody remembers the, the fairy pod mother is such a memorable idea. Yeah, and it's a it's a very like specific look to it. Like it's a very long flowing skirt. Yeah. Um I mean I wear pink now almost all the time. Um but it's it's like iconic and because it's such an I don't want to say it's an uncomfortable topic because for me it's not an uncomfortable topic. Sure. But menstruation is not usually the cutest thing. Mm. So it helps if there's like a glittery icebreaker. Yeah. That doesn't depict that I'm about to talk about blood to you. Yeah so cute until i bring it up <laughs> well i mean it's it's just another bodily fluid though really it is at the end of the day like it's it, it is not that big of a deal it just shows that your system's functioning yeah it's a good thing it shows that i mean it, it shows many things it shows your system's functioning it shows you're not pregnant like there's a lot of good things that about it yeah just clearing house you know like it's and guys guys if you want to be better people Get comfortable with the topic of menstruation. Yep. Like that's be open about talking about that sort of stuff. Cause it's not, it's like, it's not that big of a deal. And don't feel weird about buying people pads. People don't judge you like in the store for it. No. They actually will probably think like, wow, that's a really nice person. Like so caring. The yeah, cat's and, on me again. And, so. the, and the cat's going after that hair elastic again. He's got that, uh, the glint his eye yeah he's got that glint in his eye no it's it's so funny because i was thinking it's funny you mentioned the idea of what people assume what we think other people think of us in the store when mm -hmm. we're buying things like or when you're buying you know kind of taboo things i guess like you know condoms or tampons or pads or you know like yeah anything of that variety feminine products as a male or male products as a well and I mean, male products, female buying male products isn't so weird because that's just demographics has shown a lot of purchases are made by women. But especially for things that that's just considered more taboo, like anything that happens in your underwear, most people are like, yeah, yeah that's that makes me weird to look you in the eye. Yeah. But really, sorry, that was pop. But really, it's it's just another function. Yeah. It's no really different. That, I mean, we do far worse every day in terms of like not so pleasant bodily functions. So oh, sure. We can deal with this, guys. Yeah. If you're buying condoms, good on you. If you're buying pads, good on you. Yeah. 
pregnancy, pregnancy tests, whatever, you know, there's, there's whatever far, you need. yeah, there's far worse. And I don't even want to call it worse because it's just bodily stuff. You're just taking care of yourself. Yeah. This is okay. There's nothing wrong with it. It needs to stop being so damn taboo. We'll get there. Yeah. We'll evolve. I mean, the fact that we've gotten to a, the point we're at now where it's, where you can, you can go into a store and buy, you know, stuff like condoms and not, and, and people generally don't bat an eyelid. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a good place to be in society. Mm-hmm. I mean, that shows, at least to me, it makes me think we're making good progress. Yeah. And most of the time, I think that people, even if they see that you're buying these things, you're just a stranger to them. Like, I, I can't remember the last stranger that I saw in a store. So yeah. you have that much importance to the other person. Well, another part of it, too. Think about how busy the average... Think about how busy you are on a given day mm-hmm. and the amount of stuff that you've got to take care of. Because you're going down the entrepreneur, socialpreneur route. Yeah, man. You know, you're busy hustling and getting your message out there and fulfilling your destiny. I like to, well, it, it, you are basically, you found, you found your thing, you found your calling and you're going after it with, you know, the force of a, of a force five hurricane, which is like, which is freaking epic. I think more of us need to do that. I think, of, think about how busy you are and you just made the comment of, you can't remember the last stranger you saw in a shopper's drug mart. Yeah. It's like, even if somebody were to buy something weird something weird quote unquote i'm so damn busy and focused on what i've got going on next mm-hmm. that they could be buying the entire store and i probably wouldn't even notice yeah no seriously and my thoughts are so automatic that say you're buying condoms and just like oh have fun yeah or like buying pads i'm just like oh that's rough yeah sorry girl like but the amount of dedicated effort to it I won't remember it. Even if you're a friend of mine, I'll probably forget at some point. Yeah. Like, or if you're a friend of mine, I bump into and you're buying condoms. I'm still like, good luck. Have fun. But it's, but, well, but there's what other people, what people forget sometimes. And this is where the nerd part of me comes out is that having done a lot of audiovisual stuff is there's alternative uses for those things that have nothing to do with bodily fluids. True. Condoms were, have, are used on a regular basis by BBC and other and other news outlets. If you want to take a microphone underwater and waterproof it, mm. wrap it in a condom. Fair. Uh, if you want to waterproof a car to take it through deep water, you can stick a tampon in the gas nozzle so that if it absorb, it will absorb the water and expand and prevent that from getting in the gas tank. Hmm. Yeah. I remember that we would always keep pads, uh, for example, in... Um, first aid kits because if you cut yourself or even if you have like a really bad nosebleed they're just really absorbent yeah like they're just good to have even if you're a guy they're a substitute gauze pad Mm -hmm. if not even better in some ways but like they're just effective yeah they're just they're 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 built for that exactly funny that but it's like it's you know any of these things it's they have more than one purpose so they're not i don't know we're we're getting we're getting better at dealing with the stigma yeah. How are you doing for time? Pretty good. I was We're just seeing it's four forty two. Wow. Damn, son. We're doing well. But yeah, the fairy pod mother. I love how that how some of those best ideas come out of just like, oh man, just I'll do this one off thing. Yeah. Like do you know the title of this podcast, Let's Solve the Universe, came out of me coming up with a book title as a joke? I think I remember that because I think I saw a mock up of it on Facebook. Yes, that's right. I posted it to Facebook, didn't I? Yeah. Yeah. Was or that. Instagram, one or the other. Probably both. I feel like I still want to release a book called Let's Solve the Universe one day. No, the original version was called Elias Solves the Universe. Yes. Yeah. That's what I called it. And then I was thinking, I wanted to use that, but I felt like it was really pompous. Mm. Fair enough. It was really pompous. I'm like, okay, that's, but it's not just me. I'm, and especially if I'm going to turn this into a podcast. It's going to be me discussing ideas with other people. Mm -hmm. It's collaborative. So let's. Yeah. Let's solve the universe. Good title. Yeah. I like it. I think it works. Yeah, it does for sure. I'm also working on a book called The Pessimist Guide to Positive Thinking. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that could be pretty relatable to a lot of people, I think. Yeah. 
I already have the ISBN reserve, reserve for it because I'm now an e-publishing company. Very nice. Holler. Yeah, it's actually not that hard. (laughs) You basically go to Libraries Canada, open an account. What's really awesome about Canada is that if you want an ISBN number to release books or eBooks or CDs or anything, it's free. And the Americans have to pay 125 bucks per ISBN. Mm. Suckers. Sorry, guys. So, by the way, Americans, if you want a can, if you want an ISBN which is valid anywhere in the world, hit me up and I'll hook you up with one for just a hundred dollars Canadian. Which is like 75 US, depending on the time of day. True. <laughs> Very true. I know an opportunity when I see one. Gotta market all of those angles. Oh, yeah, you know it. Now, the book, I, the, I've, I've been doing a lot of writing and thinking about releasing a couple of books. Do I, it. Yeah. And I, that, I mean, that gives you more even to speak about because you'll get feedback on your ideas if you write a book. You will get reviews. Are you working on a book? Yes. Hey! We're not going to talk too much about that because it's in the process stage. But one day, yeah. Sweet! Yes. There's, um... It has to do with the fairy pod mother kind of things at this point. Um, just kind of op- like observations and things I've learned and um, seeing this community emerge. Like, it's growing worldwide. This is like a big issue. Um, so being a part of that community as it's evolving and as it's becoming more mainstream or more people are talking about it. It's just really cool to keep observations and things. Nice. And maybe one day that'll be a cool topic. A cool topic for a book. Wouldn't that be a good thing? So you heard it here first. She's Mm going to have a book out one day. One day. We don't know when. No. We don't know where. I'll hit you up for publishing. Hey, there we go. We can publish it through this thing. Amazon actually has some really decent publishing options. Yeah. So Wayne got, uh, he distributes his ebook through Amazon. But then I think he said they also did the print copy of it too. Oh, cool. Okay. And it was ridiculously cheap per copy to actually get it done. So I was like, ooh, wow, that actually brings down the barrier to entry quite a bit. Yeah, I didn't know that. Because books are kind of, books can be expensive to publish. But, I mean, if you can get the unit cost down far enough. I've had a, you know what, speaking of books, I've had a running hypothesis for a while that I've been wanting to bounce off as many people as I can. Okay. I feel like related to this topic of public speaking, public persona, and being considered an expert in a field, one of the big components seems to be that you have to have written a book. I would say that writing a book definitely gives you a lot of credibility in your field. I can't say that it gives you all the credibility because people can write some really weird books. Um, But Oh, there's some crap books out there. (laughs) I'm not going to throw shade at any of them. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) But I think that also when you have to sit down and write a book, um, it's now like a physical manifestation of what's in your brain. So to have that lend you credibility, like for public speaking and things, um, and obviously academia is all about publications, Mm. Um, it's that it's no longer bits in your head that you'll hear during a speech. It's you've configured it. You've had to, hopefully you've researched it. You've thought about what you want to say. Um, but when you write, I think it creates more of a dialogue with your audience. Like speaking still kind of does. And we talk about like playing with how you perform, um, to engage your audience. But when it's words on a page and they can digest them over a period of time, or they can go back and really look at how you structured your thoughts, that then it, it's like testing your metal almost and you become more of an expert out of all that feedback as well. Um, but I would say that I agree that it does make you more perceived as an expert. I don't know that it makes you an expert. Mm. It's part of what I, I'm trying to assemble what I call the expert formula. Okay. There seems to be a few elements to becoming an expert in a certain field. One of them feels like if you've been published or if you have a book of some sort that Mm -hmm. you have published yourself. Yeah. I find even blogs will help like lend people some credibility because your blog can turn into books later on as well, depending on how you write. Um, But for instance, the gentleman that writes the one chapter books, short synthesized things like that can be available online if you choose not to do traditional publishing, but it gives a place for people to go to 
better understand um, your thoughts and how you got there. And especially if you provide sources and things, which are very, in my opinion, are very valuable. I don't, right. not an expert. I don't know the expert formula, <laughs> <laughs> but it gives the audience and uh, listeners and readers the chance to under really understand where you're coming from and not just hear like, here's the perspective. Right. But you, and I think it's a little easier to be vulnerable mm. in writing and kind of like put yourself out there versus public speaking. Um, you have editors when you write, it's harder to just choke. Yeah. On a paragraph. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and you, you start, you have to really think about your, you have to think your ideas through. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest thing when I've been writing is just thinking the ideas through to a, to a conclusion. A lot of times the way I write is discovery writing. So I'll just write and write and write and write and write. Okay. And like I've got a giant writing file that I just keep dumping to. And What's I'm, your word count? I remember that you were pretty high. In the 400, 500,000, somewhere in there. I want to say, yeah, I feel like you're above the 500,000 like a few months ago. Yeah. I had to, I Do took a bit well. of a, I took a bit of a hiatus from the daily writing just because I reached a point where I was, I had gotten too internal mm. where I was really kind of cycling off into these really meta areas, coming up with some conclusions that were shaping some of the decision of decisions I was making in my life at that time. Yeah. And through a series of really shitty decisions, I was like, okay, wait, hold on. I've gone too deep. I need to back up and actually like experience reality for a little while instead of just, you know, what's the writing and the interpretation of this writing telling me to do? It's like, no, no, no. Just come on back. Come on back. Yeah. You know, come out of the writing for a little while. Like when I read some of that stuff now, I'm kind of like, ooh, wow, what the hell? I might have gotten a little bit too meta there. But I mean, it's it. There's definitely striking a balance. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of in that writing. I know that there's. Like if I look at some of the early pages, there's I know there's one story in particular that I started like 300 pages ago and it's not closed. Like that's the thought tree that has come out of that one idea. It's, oh, I've, I'm going to explore this one. Now I'll explore this one. Then I'll explore this one. Now we've closed this idea off. We're back to this. It's crazy sometimes. And that's one of the tricks of really good writing is, is figuring out how to condense those ideas down and mm -hmm. how to close them off. That's what I'm really experimenting with now with writing this pessimist guide to positive thinking Yeah, is I'm actually going, okay, I don't have to fill up the whole damn alpha smart file. My alpha smart is the keyboard. It holds eight files and each file can hold 10 pages worth of text. Okay. And I'm like, okay, we don't need to fill up these files to completion per chapter. Because like 10 pages at eight and a half by 11 translates to like 40 pages when you go to your typical paperback size. Yeah. So this is a new practice for me. It's, uh, it'll be interesting when that's all done. Put it through the readability. Oh man, that's going to be fun. You know what? I'm going to take all my writing and put it through the readability tool. I'm going to do that. I really want to see how crazy that is. I'm sure it's going to be eye-opening. Oh my god, it's uh it's going to be something. <laughs> when you do you do a lot of writing these days? These days not so much. Um I'm a little bit busy to do the writing, but I used to. Um so no, not currently, but why? You ever done any writing with a typewriter? I have. My parents, we had two type, two or three typewriters at home. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't know why my brother and I were so into the typewriters, <laughs> but we had, so you've got like this Olympia one that's kind of like closed in the top. We had one of those like really old style typewriters. Oh, the manual typewriter. Yeah. My brother was really oh. into like getting the ink for it and fixing it. And all, like the, we were just like fascinated by the keys and things. Like, right. Born in the wrong time, guys. No, this, so I've got that type, I've got this typewriter, which is electric, and then I've also got an old brother manual typewriter. Oh man, brother, yep. I fixed, I had one of those. Yeah, I fixed both of them up. In fact, I got the audience has to experience this. 
because I'm going to fire this up. I had to I had to adjust this thing and get it tweaked so that it would actually, like, the carriage return wasn't working. It was just sitting in a basement for 20 years. Mm. And it was mom's old typewriter. I love writing on this thing. Yeah. Just the immediate physicality of seeing the words on the page. Yeah. It's just, it's the best thing ever, isn't it? Well, for me, I found because you can't, you can go back and strike through, but because doing that is so evident, I'm a bit of a perfectionist. Yeah. So I don't like seeing that. So when I'm writing, I like, with a typewriter, I actually have to like sit back more and I feel like, I don't know, like a, one of the old men in England writing <laughs> being like, oh, I need to contemplate. <laughs> it's the, the few times, the times when I've done writing with my electric typewriter, I've, I love the romanticism of writing with it late at night of just me and the typewriter there and it making all that noise and I'm sipping an herbal tea or something like that. Like the only thing missing is a tobacco pipe. Yeah. I feel like that aesthetic. Yeah. That whole aesthetic is there's something really romantic about that, but just for the audience, you have to experience this. So this is the Olympia Monica electric, the symphony. And I feel like when you're writing and you're emotional, having the typewriter, like, it's like playing a piano when you just really push into the keys, like, you become one. I have written... <laughs> With the experience. Oh, yeah. I love... when The political writing that I've done on that typewriter has been some of my best. Yeah. Honestly, some of my all-time best writing, my favorite writing, has been on the typewriter. I'm not really envious and I want a typewriter in my apartment for just for journaling purposes. They are all over Kijiji. Find yourself a typewriter. Uh, we used to get them in um, like thrift shops and things like yes. they're all over. And you're just like mine. Yeah. My parents would be like, you have enough. <laughs> we have a computer. You use the computer for all of your official things. I know. But so childhood Amanda was like, yeah. can I just have all of these? Well, now we now Windows has got built-in optical character recognition. So what happens is when I complete an article on the Olympia or mm -hmm. my brother typewriter, I'll scan it in and it'll convert it to computer-readable text. Okay. And then I can edit it and tweak it there. Yeah. Which, it's not 100% perfect, but it gets me like 90% of the way there and I can fix... I actually wrote a program that uses Windows built-in uh, OCR. Mm -hmm. And it gives me side by side the scanned in PDF and the text output. So I can just see them right immediately side by side and do a lot of editing right on the spot. But the amount of passion that goes into the Olympia typewriter is high. The passion that goes into the brother manual typewriter is the most. Yeah. The abs because that one is that whole experience is you have to be able to hit the keys physically hard enough. Yeah, I remember to leave that, that imprint with the the big key ones that we had at home, and like that. Oh, it just felt so good. And we also had like a pipe yes. organ and things like. So for me, just getting your feelings out. In oh, dude, keys. you guys had a pipe organ. It wasn't like a huge one, but it was like one of those internal pipe yeah, organ yeah, yeah. ones. It had two decks, had all the pedals, oh. had all like the settings. It was like it was actually a really decent um, organ, and. Like it was worth a good amount of money, I guess. I we don't have any more. But we bought it for ten dollars at a yard sale from someone down the block from us. They were like, We don't want it. And my parents were like, I don't know if we want it in the house. My brother was like, We need it. <laughs> so Decision it, made. So it sat in the basement. I had many days of like cranking the volume all the way up. And I don't know if anyone has seen the second Beauty and the Beast movie, but there is um a pipe organ because everything's like humanized in right. beauty and the beast so like the candle talks to you in the teapot so does the organ and his name is maestro and there's just there's one scene where he gets really really angry so he just smashes his own keys down because he wants to like vibrate the walls of the castle to the point that the castle like crumbles so i remember if i was ever upset i would just like crank my pipe organ up and just push some minor chords and be like yeah that feels good <laughs> I can feel my anger. I'm inspired now. <laughs> and I wasn't like an angry person, but you know, you just stuff frustrates you during the day and you're just like, I'm going to go get this out. And Sometimes you got to get that shit out. Hit some keys. Yeah. Sometimes you just need to go and, and vent that somehow. Like I don't need a human to deal with this. I just need to get this energy into something. Yeah. 
so it's productive or it's like if you do martial arts and like you hit a heavy bag it's a much safer thing than just like being an irritated individual do you do martial arts i did currently haven't been training for a couple of months um because i moved up here and my club is in st thomas oh but i was doing taekwondo i've done um kickboxing i've done some boxing i've done some brazilian jiu-jitsu uh adrenaline mma here in london is a really great gym so i trained there for a little bit it's a great sport brazilian jiu-jitsu uh any i mean all martial arts right um yeah, I've been doing them since hmm, middle school on and off. So my friends had a like ring set up in their basement. So all of the gifted kids who would go to like advanced academic programming after school, we would come and just beat each other up. <laughs> <laughs> so I learned how to grapple on someone who was like six foot two. Holy Christ. Yeah. Becky is a goddess. You're extremely tall and beautiful. But maybe she's not six two. You're very tall. You're gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> but... I am not. So, yeah. Or some of the guys would come over and get, you get a little bit banged up because you're, you know, sparring and things. But sure. it was just a really good release and especially like a physical release. Because if you're one of the academic students, you're usually like in oh. brain mode all the time for like yes. six to eight hours straight. And then you come home and are just like, I still have energy. Yes. So just, and it was all in good fun. And it's like, breaking a puzzle or like solving a puzzle when you're sparring somebody because they're obviously trying to counter you and you're trying to counter them so the whole process is just it's like yeah physical code breaking somebody on joe rogan's podcast recently said almost exactly that oh really that's crazy i like a lot of us feel that way i'm pretty sure yeah it's yeah. the the martial arts are something that i've never really done but now that I'm a lot more fit than I was, I'm really thinking about like, what's my next move there? Yeah. Well, even just starting, I find like kickboxing, for instance, because there's not a lot of sparring that you'll do in it is really good for getting technique, just getting kind of used to the idea of it. Some of the more like intense cardio or conditioning. Um, yeah. My most formal martial art is Taekwondo. That's, that's a very fun sport. And then my friends have done things from karate to judo to um, like Japanese jujitsu and you just mix the styles, have fun with it. You'll learn something. And it was adrenaline, M MMA, yeah. adrenaline, MMA. And do they, are they just kind of everything or do they specialize in a I particular? Think, no, they've got multiple things. So they do boxing, they do kickboxing, they do Brazilian jujitsu. They do, uh, MMA courses. If you stay there long enough, um, and then they have like yoga and conditioning and things. So it's when, if you get a membership there, it's really whatever you want to do. Hmm. I liked trying everything. Right. But if you're just more specific that you want to just do boxing and kickboxing, that's fine. If you just want to be a grappler, that's cool. Yeah. The facility is really good as well. Neat. Yeah. Right. I might just have to check that out. I'm pretty sure that they still have a free trial online. If you go to their website, I believe it's adrenaline MMA.com. Um, if you Google adrenaline MMA, you'll get there, but it's like a tap the pros free day or free week i'm not sure what it is anymore um but they let you come check out the facility so they've got a boxing ring they've got uh, hanging bags they've got a training space upstairs downstairs they've got it's, it's not an octagon because it can't be an octagon but it is a caged shape that i don't remember mm. <laughs> and that's where you do grappling and they've got like a little bit of a gym down there so Wow. It's a really good space to train, even if you're not like super big into martial arts and you just want to learn kind of some defense and then have a workout space. It's still really good. And the instructors Neat. are great. Cool. Yeah. I will make, we'll make sure to put their link in the show notes just because adrenaline promo. <laughs> yeah. Adrenaline promo. It's free promotional material here, folks. Wow. Okay. We have covered a ton of different topics. I feel like we're coming to the end of our podcast here. I've got so much more that I'd love to ask you. So we'll have to do this again sometime. I say we can always book a second one. We can always book a second one, man. Where can people go to find out more about you and more about the Fairy Pod Mother? If you go on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, Facebook and Instagram are the most active, but just look up Fairy Pod Mother, and that's P-O-D. I know in Canada, we just legalized marijuana. A lot of people think I say the Fairy Pot Mother. Really? Yeah. And they're like, what does that mean? I'm like, no, no, no. Well, now that's going to be a thing. So... P-O-D, <laughs> mother. Um, and if you see a blonde girl in a pink dress, you found the right one. <laughs> <laughs> 
Fairy Pod Mother on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Yes. Facebook and Instagram are the most active ones. Yes. Well, I have to definitely look at getting you some of those domain names <laughs> so that you can put your blog and all that up there. Yes, sir. But that'll be good stuff. Amanda McNev, that was awesome. Thank you for having me. Thank you. It was my pleasure. And we will talk to you, dear listener, next time. Here comes the outro. Bye. Thank you for listening to Let's Solve the Universe. This podcast can be heard every Saturday at lstupodcast.com. For more information about Let's Solve the Universe, head over to our Facebook page, Let's Solve the Universe Podcast, or check out the Let's Solve the Universe website because you know you want to. Complete show notes and information about all our guests can be found there. And I thank you, dear listener, for sharing your time with us. And we'll talk to you next Saturday.